Do I need to share the screen now? Yep. Are you and what should I do on this, the Zoom webinar? Should I minimize that? Well, um, we also need, I need a, a brief moment. Yeah, we're going to once you start to. Uh, Good, good afternoon. I'm Rogers Livingood, board president. And before we begin today's presentation, I would like to express the board's appreciation to all those who have worked many hours to prepare this next year's proposed budget. First, Jim Whitmore, who oversees the process, department heads who helped prepare the, their department budgets, Nancy Roberts, Kurt Stiegel, Tom Shepard, Robert Ayers, Sharon Jenkins, and a special shout out to Joey Tyner, the controller, who does much work on preparing the layout and getting it on paper, the budget on paper. In addition, the finance committee plays a major role in helping to make sure we have a budget that is financially stable. I would like to thank Rich Gintner. He's the chair, Bob Coffin, member, Chuck Dunn, member, John Harris, a member, Steve Meadows, a member, Jan Newson, a member, Mark Stevens, a member, Jim Ungaro, the board liaison, who has also been a longtime server on the finance committee and has done enormous work to help make sure Conesty stays financially stable. Carol Blank, who is, serves as an alternate, as well as Keith Butler and Craig Harton. Thanks to all of you. Normally we would offer a round of applause, but I feel kind of silly applauding by myself. So we will, <laughs> we will move on from there. And now I give it to Jim. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Roger. Uh, we thank everyone for tuning in to this budget, a little different this year than uh, previous years, but hopefully you'll get a good feel of uh, the 2021 budget, and uh, then we will go through the normal process that we go through every year, and we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation. So what are we going to do today? The first thing we're going to talk about is we are going to talk about the budget prep process overview. Uh, we're going to intro, which Roz already did, the finance committee members. Uh, we're going to do a quick update on the COVID financial impact, um, an executive summary, uh, 2021 budget highlights of the income and expenses, reserve spending, and then what happens now once we get done with this presentation today. And the Q&A will not be a, a standard Q&A. Uh, we will be asking for questions starting after this meeting uh, to be delivered to the uh, email address of record, which we'll go into later today. And then we'll have a future meeting later on to go over all the comments and questions that were sent in so we can respond to anyone that sent in some comments and or questions. Um, when we talk about the COVID financial update, uh, let me go into that real quick right now. Um, we've done a lot of proactive uh, things to try to minimize the impact of the COVID pandemic from a financial perspective. Uh, right now, it appears that we will end up pretty much on budget. We had been looking at a uh, potential loss, but I think that we are getting that under control. I'll go into that a little further um, here in a, in a little bit. So this whole process starts with the board. Uh, they submit a guidance letter to both the GM and the finance committee uh, of highlights and a sort of a 30,000 foot level uh, scenario of how they would like to see the budget play out. And then what happens at that point is myself and the controller, Joey Tyner, and staff start meeting and start working out all the details uh, of both revenue and expense line items so that we can come up uh, with a proposed budget. The finance committee then will get involved and we will meet with the finance committee, myself and Joey, the controller, and we'll meet separately again with each department head to clarify and in some cases adjust parts of each department budget. And then finance committee in concert with myself will arrive at a budget and make a recommendation uh, to the board uh, which is pretty much where we are now and we'll make that to the membership first and then we will then have a, a vote of the of the owners at a later, later date once the board votes on this 
And we'll go into that a little later as well. I'll skip over this slide because Raj already went over all the people that were involved on the finance committee. Uh, just want to, I can't tell you the amount of hours, but it's at least, I think, four or five official meetings and many email chains in between. Uh, so it's many, many hours that go in between the finance committee members, uh, the board and staff as this budget process goes through its normal steps. So again, talking about the COVID, we have been, we have been continuing to manage in a fiscally responsible manner um, of the pandemic. We plan on doing a reforecast again after we get our financials done for the month of September. Uh, we actually started that today. Uh, up until um, today, actually, it appeared that we were potentially gonna have a loss of around $40,000 at the end of the year. Um, with some of the positive things that are happening right now with both our expen expense management and some revenue increases, we think that we have the ability to actually break even or make some money this year. That's a new, new as of 20 minutes ago, pretty much. So I think the, at the end of the day, the, you know, the pandemic impact from a financial perspective will be very minimal to the association. Looking back when we were first starting to talk about this in March and April, May, when it was really crazy, we were very concerned about um, lots of different scenarios, but we were able to have been very proactive and we've done some voluntary layoffs we did. Uh, we reduced some clubhouse and F&B staff. Uh, we did uh, receive the employee uh, CARES employee retention credits. That's been uh, significant to help us out. Um, but we have incurred about forty dollars or $50,000 year to date in COVID type expenses, the screenings, sanitizers and such. Um, and like I say, that forecast now looks like it's gonna be not 40,000, but closer to break even or make basically on or better than budget. And uh, there will be no special assessment uh, required because of COVID. So if we look at things as a, as a whole here and we look at the, uh, the summary, the executive summary, the recommendation for the assessment would be to increase uh, the improved lot $136 for next year and the unimproved lot $82. Um, we are recommending this assessment increase, which will allow us to be consistent with our strategic and comprehensive master plans. I would encourage anyone who is not familiar with those plans to go onto, our, onto the website and go under the, I believe it's under the governance tab, and you'll see these two documents. A, very, a lot of time was spent by, these, uh, by both the strategic planning committee, the board, to do these, um, these plans. Um, and they make us stay consistent with our vision and mission of promoting providing, preserving, and sustaining the economy lifestyle. We also wanna make sure in every budget we do for every year that we have adequate funding of our capital and infrastructure reserves. And we continue to do on uh, timely maintenance, repair, and placement of our assets, along with needed other capital, potential capital additions. Uh, uh, we also are reducing reliance on the amenity fee to support operations by $25,000. Uh, historically, the last few years has been $50,000. Uh, we talked about this uh, quite at length, but we decided to only go by 25,000 this year and lower that to 75,000 for 2021 um, instead of the 50, because we just still have some uncertainty of how, the, especially the beginning of the year in 2021 will play out uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic still being a possible Billy or most likely uh, still having to deal with some issues there going at the beginning, at least the first quarter of 2021. Um, the budget does include a 3% uh, wage increase uh, for the staff, but overall the net wages are decreasing uh, by $5,200 because we have done some uh, reorganization in, uh, in the clubhouse and food and beverage staff, um, which has saved us uh, one position. And then uh, group, group health insurance though, did go up uh, by $20,000. We'll go into that a little different, a little, a little bit more detail later, but that actually is... Uh, a very good number that com comparing to what our original estimates were gonna be on group health. It's a very difficult market to, uh, to work and play, but we did a good job on um, uh, renewing our, our policy for the 2020 year. We have a delay, sorry. Why is it not moving? There we go, sorry about that. So the 2021, uh, process, the things that we concentrate on are balancing own, owner priorities. And the finance committee especially is focused on managing in a fiscally prudent manner, 
including sufficient reserves to care for what we own and what we plan for our future, uh, identifying and managing risk, which basically is worrying about reserves, insurance, and investments, uh, maintaining and enhancing property values. That's a key element all the time, no matter what we do, whether it's budgets or uh, amenities or how we uh, focus on service levels. And then we also recognize that we have a very diverse membership. Uh, we all have different uh, opinions, different values. We all use the amenities differently. Um, and there's varying degrees of financial stability and disposable income. We want to keep all those things in the back of our mind when we work on, on, on the budgets. And then in the capital budgets, we want to make sure that all the capital and operating costs have been reasonably estimated. How will they be funded? And can we afford to continue to maintain not only what we have, but what we plan on doing in the future? So if we look at sort of the high level of looking at our total revenue and total expenses, um, we can do that here. Uh, roughly with the new assessment, we'll bring in roughly $5.5 million in revenue. In other income, which is property fees, golf, food and beverage, wellness, we'll bring in approximately $3.2 million in revenue. So that gives us a total income of $8.7 million if you round it off. Um, and then we also have expenses of six point four million dollars. We also have to move money over to the reserves to make sure they're uh, fully funded. That's 2.3 million. And then we're going to expend this coming year 2.6 million in reserves. So our reserves will actually decrease by $343,000. And we'll go into that a little further when we get into the presentation about capital reserves and all the reserves. To give you now the number of what the assessment will end up being is with the $136 recommended increase an improved lot will go from $3,362 a year to $3,498, which is equivalent to a 4.05% increase. An unimproved lot will go from 2017 to 2099, which is an $82 increase, and that's a four, also a 4.05% increase. So from a monthly perspective, that's $11.33 per month for an improved lot and $6.83 per month for an unimproved lot. So let's go into pretty much all the things that impacted the budget, the, the main line items uh, that impacted the increase, and uh, then we'll go from there. As talked two slides ago, health insurance went up $20,000. That, equ that equates to a 5.8% premium over 2020. Uh, but our original quote when we sent it out to the, uh, basically the main carriers, which is Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, United Healthcare, Humana, came back at 17% uh, by doing some tweaking to our plan on some uh, co-pays and drug costs and so forth. They're able to reduce that increase from 17% to 5.8%. I give Joey Tyner credit for that. He worked very hard working with the different um, agents to come up with that, with this new plan that uh, still gives the employees a great benefit, uh, but saved us quite a bit of money. So uh, we talked about the salaries uh, reduction is $5,200, and that's just basically uh, restructuring a little bit on, on how we're operating food and beverage and clubhouse, knowing that uh, we're not sure exactly when we're going to be able to open full time based, to the, based on the pandemic. So we made some assumptions there. The amenity fee supports that gets reduced by $25,000 that we talked about in the last slide, going from $100 to $75,000. So that impacts $25,000. Uh, the capital funding increase is $29,000. That's the amount of money that we had to put into the capital fund to make sure that there's a proper amount of balance in the fund to maintain the assets that we have. Because each year we go in and we adjust potential uh, purchase costs of new equipment that's coming online or maybe going offline that we're going to have to replace. And then also what the useful life of that piece of equipment is as well. Uh, the infrastructure uh, funding increase is $21,000. We'll go into that. Um, what's, what's constituting that a little further in the uh, presentation as well. And then access control is $24,000. And that's basically uh, some payroll increase uh, that Allied Security, which is our contract subcontractor who does that work. Uh, they're passing along a uh, increase of payroll costs to their staff. And then we're also fully staffed. They are fully staffed now on all the gates and the roving patrol. So that's actually the first time in almost three years that we've had uh, a full clientele of uh, gate access people um, 
uh, serving us on a daily basis. We are also, uh, even though like this year you saw before a couple of slides ago, we had about almost forty, fifty thousand dollars in COVID expenses um, so far this year. Uh, we're hoping that things get better, so we are reducing that. But we still think that we're going to have twenty-five thousand dollars of potential COVID expenses in twenty twenty-one. Uh, the utilities, we're adding Wi-Fi to all the parks in the different areas that you've, you've heard about. That's $14,000. Um, property insurance, again, went up uh, $12,000, but that, again, is pretty good comparatively to everything that we uh, have to insure. Uh, permits and licenses is up $16,000. That's pretty much mostly related to uh, upgrading to Microsoft Office 365 for all of our people that have uh, email and use uh, Office products. Uh, we had a hodgepodge before of having to buy licenses for one person to use PowerPoint, not the other person. And this then will allow us to get any updates on Microsoft products uh, going into the future. And that's $16,000. And then all the other thousands of line items that are in there total up to $40,000. You know, it's a significant number, but we didn't break that down because there's so many different line items that impact that $40,000. So in total, um, all the different impacts of expenses went up $221,000 or 4.05%, which is what we are asking for in the assessment. So when you look at this in a more of a holistic approach of the overall operation, how does this really look when you look at a, a pie chart? Uh, you'll see that the majority of your assessment is going into Thank you. Okay, sorry. Battery died. Um, so 25% of the assessment goes into the capital reserve funding, the infrastructure funding, uh, which is basically the most significant part of, of the uh, budget. And then 21% is for administration, which is all your, basically all your administration office staff and all your insurance, all the different things that are considered administration costs. Um, general maintenance, which is Spencer's crew, uh, road maintenance, snow plowing, Lake maintenance, everything else that gets done on a day-by-day -day basis is 20% uh, of the budget. Uh, keeping this clubhouse open for member usage under normal circumstances is 10%, and that includes your wellness center. Golf is 10%, access control is 7%, and food and beverage is 7%. So when we talk a lot about, uh, you know, the different things that are included in the budget and, and um, create your assessment. There's a lot of talk all the time about food and beverage, especially in golf, but the reality is those are not major, major parts of your assessment. If you were to get rid of those two things, you really wouldn't save that much money, um, but I think you'd have a major impact on your property values if both of those things were closed. So um, in a dollar amount, you can look at it in this chart. Again, capital funding is 884, which was that 25% we talked about on the, on the pie chart. Administration costs is 723. General maintenance is 715. Clubhouse, wellness center, and the pool is 350. Golf is 343. And food and beverage is 227. And you'll see that all, both those calculate to the total assessment for an improved lot at 3498 and an unimproved lot at uh, 2099. Uh, this is a chart we look at consistently every year when we do the budget. We like to go back at least five years and see are we being pretty consistent on, uh, on payroll comparatively uh, on a year to year basis versus other expenses. So you go back here on 2016, the chart on the left, we are actually payroll expenses were 68% of the other of the uh, and 32% were other expenses. And you'll see over the last five years, it stayed pretty steady. Uh, we're actually one per, in 2021, we're 1% lower than we were in 2020, where it was at 66%. So it's stayed pretty consistent, anywhere from 68% to 65% year over year. Um, so that's a pretty nice chart to look at to see that we're being consistent year over year with our expenses. So let's look at golf a little bit. We're going to look at golf and food and beverage, which are the two main uh, revenue uh, generators besides, um, besides assessments, obviously. So in golf income, uh, the, 2021, the 2020 budget is 871, and we're basing this on the, on the budget versus actual. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with uh, golf and the pandemic, uh, there's been some in, uh, bad impact on golf in a sense that we decided from a safety perspective that we were not going to 
take any outside play uh, for quite a while. Actually, we haven't taken any yet. Uh, we are looking at maybe changing that. But so basically, since March, we've taken no outside income on the golf course. So it was going to be tough to compare it to 2020 actuals or 2019 even. Uh, so we just used a budget of 2020. Uh, 2021 budget is $883,000 in income versus 871. Uh, employee expenses are going up from 896 to 919. That's two things. That's the three percent that we talked about. Uh, plus, we do have a full uh, staff of in golf maintenance now, um, where historically we have not. We've always always been two or three people short, uh, but right now we are have a full contingent minus one basically um, in the golf maintenance department. And then the other expenses are staying pretty steady at 507 for 2020 and 505 for 2021. Uh, which shows you a uh, a subsidy of golf of 541 versus the budget of 532. In golf, though, we continue to uh, raise the bar as far as the um, membership dues go so that we're getting uh, the golfers that use the course the most to try to pay more proportionally into the golf operation. So we're raising golf membership dues by 3% for 2021, and they were raised 5% for 2020 as well. So that's a $6,000 increase in revenue based on our membership, which is now 166. Um, and the budgeted uh, members for next year is the, is the same at 166 because we're currently at 162. Uh, we had quite a few of the six month memberships not rejoin this year because they stayed, they decided to stay either in Florida or wherever they were and not come back for the season this year due to the pandemic. Uh, we're also raising the cart fees, $2 each. Uh, that will bring in an extra four. Uh, the, so the total fees now for the golf operation will be 436,000 between the cart fees and the outside play for 2021. And we're raising the range membership from 375, or it's, it, sorry, from 375 to 400 for a single and 475 to 500 for a family. Um, the new practice facility um, has been doing great since we opened. Uh, the first couple of months was a 26% increase in the usage of, of the range as far as revenue goes. For the month of September, it was actually 46%. So it was even higher last month. Uh, I didn't have a chance to update this because that just happened today when we were looking at the end of month, end of, end of month number for September. The other thing that we are adding is non-golf member property owners are now allowed to pay a walking fee of $25 for 18 and 15 for nine. That's new. Historically, uh, I think they were trying to force potentially property owners to join because they didn't let them walk. But obviously with COVID and uh, scenario, especially in March and April, uh, people were asking to play. Uh, so we created this new um, new fee and it's been going over very, very well. We have lots of new property owners, uh, non-member property owners that have been enjoying the golf course uh, so far this year. And I think a lot of that's due to the pandemic, unfortunately, I guess. When we look at food and beverage, we're gonna look at 2019, again, which is our only sort of normal year that we've had in the last few years. We felt that was the best way to compare. So in 2019, we had revenue of 909, and we're basically doing a food and beverage budget saying, hey, let's, let's basically assume we're gonna have the same type of year we did in 2019 when we were fully open and doing normal operations. So nothing really changes here that much. You'll see that it's, and we're actually making an improvement on F&B. From a three hundred seventy-eight dollar subsidy, or three hundred seventy-eight thousand dollar subsidy to a three hundred fifty-nine thousand dollar subsidy, but pretty much we're making that up as in our other expenses. Um, we're doing some more things in, internally that we used to uh, use some contracts for, so that will save us some money there. So, like we said, the food and beverage is based on the two thousand nineteen actuals. Again, I know food and beverage is talked about a lot, but when you look at the net expense is equal about 7% of the assessment. If you look at McGladry, and even though it's not apples to apples, uh, they, they have clubs in Florida of over three or 400 clubs, and they do this study every year on those clubs, and their state average is 16%, and the lowest one in that survey is 12%. So again, it's a little different, but I, I would venture to say that we are doing very, very competitively in our food and beverage operation as a percent of our assessment. Uh, when you look at the, um, oops, let me just move this through real quick. Okay. Yeah, when you look at our other revenue that we bring in, 
Um, you can see that the total property fees for 2020 budget were $950,000 roughly. And we're looking to bring in a little over a million dollars next year. Our amenity fees to the reserve projected for 2020 was 659,000. That's actually gonna be way higher than that. Uh, we have done, uh, not, not we personally, but the market has been extremely strong, uh, not only in Transylvania County, but especially in Conesee Falls, uh, where we probably will end up selling more units, resale units in 2020 than we did in 2019, which is crazy. Uh, when we were going in March and April and talking about reforecasting, we're like, are we going to have any sales? Are we going to have any rentals? What, what's going to happen? Turns out the pandemic actually had more people trying to get away to these type of areas and sales have been going to the roof. So uh, again, that 659 was based on when we did this as of, um, as of the end of September, I think we already have, we're going to be close to that already. So things are moving along good. Um, and then the amount spent from the amenity reserve for 2020, we're going to spend $1.5 million this year, and we're going to spend 320000 next year, and we'll detail where that $320,000 is going. Uh, the other thing we're going to do for 2021 is we're going to uh, increase the amenity fee uh, from 10000 to 12000 but there will be an option if the people prepay uh, to pay 10000 So reality is almost everyone this year has taken, taken the um, discount of the paying 8,000 versus 10, so I'm sure most will pay the 10 next year, but it is a $2,000 increase uh, in the amenity fee in 2021. And we talked about the amenity fee going down from 100,000 to 75. So we still want to continue to work on the program to make operations uh, self-funding and not to rely on the amenity fee at all. So that will continue, I'm sure, in 2022, 2023, and so forth. So now we're going to talk about the reserves a little bit. So I just want to make sure everyone understands all our different reserves and what they're used for. Um, the first one is the amenity reserve. So the amenity reserve is the fee that we charge every time a, a home sells, resells within the community. Uh, we keep that in, in the fund and then we create interest on that money as well. And that is used specifically for construction of, construction of and or additions or modifications to uh, community amenities. Um, there's no designate, and it does have a little bit, like we say right now, $75,000 of support for operations, but we'll hope, hopefully at some point not, not be relying on that, those funds. Um, the capital reserve fund comes out of your, is part of your assessment, like we talked about earlier in the presentation. And we create interest on that account as, it's, as the balance increases. And that's designed to replace any physical asset we have that costs more than $2,500 and has a useful life of less than 30 years. So all those items are listed on a spreadsheet. They all have what the, uh, the purchase cost was, what the useful life is, what the, and what the um, uh, replacement cost is. And then we put some assumptions in there, like a 3% increase of inflation and so forth. And we push that out over those 30 years and determine, okay, what kind of money do we need to put in this account to make sure as our assets depreciate that we can replace them through this fund. The infrastructure reserve is also part of your HOA assessment. Uh, we create interest on that as well. And that basically goes to help offset the costs to maintain the dams, the roads, the culverts, forest management. We'll go further into that in the next couple of slides. And then the emergency fund is a fully funded uh, reserve. It's got $730,000 in it, which was capped off a couple of years ago. It's been talked about whether that's enough or not enough, but we feel it is sufficient at this time. And it's designed to offset any unusual uh, and unexpected uh, budget expenses. Um, and it would potentially could be used to offset a, an operating deficit. I believe that's never been used as far as I know, correct? Right, it's never been used. We actually talked about it one time earlier this year during the pandemic that is that something we'd want to use if we needed to. Luckily, we, once we got past about the first three months, we realized we weren't gonna need any of those funds. So here's the balances in all these accounts. In the emergency fund, we just mentioned 730,000. So at the end of the year, there'll probably potentially be a little bit more than that because we do earn interest on the money. But right now the interest rate you get is about 0.1 or 0.1%. So it's not a lot. Um, the capital reserve, uh, the current balance on that is $1.9 million roughly. Uh, we'll be adding 
um, 681,000 to that, but we'll be spending $1.5 million as well. So we'll have an ending balance there in 951. The infrastructure reserve has a balance of, we'll have a balance of 368,000 at the beginning of the year. Uh, we'll bring in $758,000, but be spending 724,000. So the ending balance at end of 2021 will be 402,000. Uh, the amenity fund is 2.3 million. We're looking to bring in potentially 848,000. Um, we'll spend 320,000, which we'll talk about a little later. So hopefully we'll have about $2.8 million in the amenity reserve at the end of 2021. So in our total reserves, we'll have almost $5 million in total reserves um, at the end of 2021. So let's talk about the infrastructure reserve first, um, the items that are within that. Uh, like we talked about the roads, uh, we're projecting to spend $397,000 on road maintenance next year. Uh, anyone who doesn't know, we have 55 miles road, about 10 miles or of shoulders. So we plan every year to do about three miles of roadway each year. That fluctuates depending on weather and timing, but that's normally what we've been trying to do. Uh, culverts, we're gonna spend $123,000 to continue our slip lining project that's been going on for multiple years. That will be, that, that will cover about 10 to 15 culverts in 2021 that will get slip lined. Uh, forest management um, is $110,000. That's going up about 20,000, 21,000. You'll sell that, we saw that in a previous slide. And most of that really only, the other part of that is normal cost, which is uh, tree work that has to get done, whether trees falling, whether trees having to get trimmed along the roadways. Uh, but we are putting $21,000 in the budget to get some consulting and some expertise on our forest management to determine if we need to do some um, things here proactively in the forest to make sure that we have a, uh, the forest and, and lakes and so forth to make sure we have a, a good uh, safe environment in, the, in these areas. Uh, the dams is again, the same amount that we pretty much always spend, which is the silt basins and maintaining berms and so forth. And the other is the same as years past 62,000. We didn't increase that. And this is just miscellaneous things that happen throughout the year, storm maintenance, uh, contractors that we have to bring in to help because, uh, you know, it's just too much work to do all at the same time for the current staff that we have. But that's consistent with what we spent the last few years. So in the amenity reserve, we have these projects that we are looking to get approval for. Um, we're almost finally done with the upper deck clubhouse project, which is the longest four month project I've ever been involved in and didn't have that much <laughs> roof, or, roof or anything over it, but it's amazing um, what's happening. So just as a, a sideline, I was talking to the contractor yesterday and when we started the project, they were paying like uh, $12 a sheet for plywood and now it's 23. <laughs> so, and you can't get it. You gotta wait two weeks to get it. I mean. Right now, what we're waiting on is a siding, the cedar siding, which is normally you can buy anywhere, we couldn't get. We had to wait three weeks to get cedar siding. But anyway, I digress. Uh, so anyway, and once that's done, we have some great opportunity on the lower deck, which is the area between the um, grill and the fitness center to create some more uh, HVAC controlled uh, um, area for usage. Uh, so we're looking to get approval to spend $150,000 to look at ways to help expand potentially some fitness opportunity and or grill opportunities on that lower deck now that will be waterproof because that whole deck is waterproof now. We're looking to expand down at the Atagahi Park shelter. Um, again, during COVID, we didn't need it, but normally our Atagahi Park is very busy, especially when we have some of the bigger clubs that want to use um, uh, the park. So we'd like to expand that by 30 to 50% 30 to depending on how we decide to design it. Uh, the equestrian center, is another area that has some great opportunity. We'd like to have $10,000 to look at what um, some options may be to convert that space to some, to some usable space. We are also looking at um, putting in some security fencing, especially along Carson Creek and Walnut Hollow, and where there's very, very easy access for anyone off property to just walk across a very small piece of wooded area and get, in, get access to the community. We're looking to expand the organic gardens um, and build some on the opposite side of the creek. Uh, that's $15,000. Um, the matching beautification, this is a 20,000. That's something that's uh, a standard thing we do every year. 
I just want to throw one thing out here, uh, talking about the beautification and it's more than that, but um, volunteerism, uh, this, this line item especially would be a huge line item if we didn't have the volunteers that help with, I don't even know, I think it's 40 or 50 gardens that are throughout the community. And then you talk about the trail builders as well, the work that they do, the work the fishing club does, um, all things that if those groups didn't get involved uh, would be direct impact and cost to the association. I did some rough numbers the other day and I think it would be well close to $100,000 of costs that would be associated if these groups, volunteers didn't help out. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're concerned about is that it appears that um, the volunteerism is, is declining. Uh, we have some of it is aging out that they're just, you know, can't physically do it anymore. So we need to get some new blood in and get those. So we will be doing a very, I'm working with those groups to do a very active campaign uh, come this winter and the spring to get people, new people involved in the volunteerism because I think when people can understand how much money it saves, for about $35,000, about is equivalent, give or take, to 1% of an assessment. So $100,000 just figured out would be about a 3% increase going forward forever if those volunteers weren't around. So I encourage anyone who's listening, if you have any interest in any, anything that can volunteer for, we'd be interested to talk to you. Um, and then we also would like to continue. We know we probably... Um, are in planning here in the near future to build a, a new wellness or activity center. We don't think there's the appetite for that right now, but we'd at least like to continue looking at options and planning so that we may be able to come back with another opportunity um, in the fitness and wellness bubble. Oops, the wrong button. I think I froze it up. Hold on, technical. I hit the shared screen, I think, but it's locked. Oh, here we go. Yep, I'm good. Thank you. Yep, I'm good. Sorry about that. It's never perfect, is it? Um, so when we look at the capital expenditures, there's two big capital expenditures um, that have been planned for many years. One is a golf course irrigation project, and the other one is a clubhouse roof of this building here. Uh, the golf course irrigation project is 978,000, and the roof is 120,000. And we'll go a little bit into detail. I mean, the roof, I think, is self-explanatory, but we'll go into the golf course irrigation project a little bit so that everyone understands what that includes. So the golf course irrigation system here was installed in 1994, which is 26 years ago. Um, if anyone goes on to Google or any uh, type of uh, site that gives you information, the average uh, lifespan of PVC is about 25 years. Now, that's assuming PVC, that's relatively new. That's what they say for PVC today, uh, which is made differently than it was 25 years ago. So we are definitely past our useful life in our, in our system. The current system is pretty outdated and inefficient from a maintenance and water usage perspective. A new system would... Uh, reduce your repair and maintenance expense and save up to 35% uh, using less water. Uh, this project has been uh, properly funded over many years and it's in the capital reserve. And it's been planned well in advance from the capital reserve fund. So the funds are, are already allocated for this project. The original system was actually built uh, to just do tees and greens. And then uh, I think about 20 years ago, it was added to do a center line, which is just basically down the middle of the fairway. So you don't even get coverage of the, all the fairway and you don't get any coverage of the rough at all. So there's no head-to-head -head coverage. And there will be no other, there are no other major golf course reinvestment plans in the near future in the capital reserve. Uh, this is the last major uh, improvement. Um, what we're recommending to do here is we went out and bid this project to, to four companies and we had them bid it th a couple different ways. Uh, HDPE, which is high density polyurethane uh, regular PVC, and then a hybrid, which would be a combination of both. The HDPE product is more expensive, but so we were a little nervous how that was all going to play out, but it turns out that those bids came in better because it's a lot less labor intensive uh, to install it. And what's great about it is it's, it's more flexible than PVC. Um, it's great for rocky soils and tree root type of systems, which we have, um, and it's uh, much dur more durable in heat and cold. 
and it comes with a 10 year warranty from the contractor where PVC uh, isn't warranted at all from a product perspective, um, but the contractor would uh, give you a year, a year warranty on the PVC after, after the installation. So this is a great product with a great warranty as well. And what makes HDP better is that it comes in rolls of 2000 feet. So you can run it a lot further without having to have as many joints in the system. And 90% of the time when you have a failure in the system of an irrigation system, it's in the joints. Um, so this will minimize that as well. And the useful life of this product is, uh, is 50 years, which is double PVC. So no one, I hate to say it, but no one in this room will have to worry about the next uh, irrigation installation within Conacy. So how does the cost of this project break down? Um, the project materials, you have a total cost of 978,000 like we discussed. The irrigation materials themselves, which are the heads, you're, we're gonna replace 282 heads and add 422 more. Uh, we're gonna add 13 communication satellites, uh, 70,000 linear feet of pipe, 130,000 linear feet of electrical wire and 105 valves. So that costs 250,000 just for the product itself. Uh, the contractor comes in at 660,000 to do the installation. There will be some sod uh, that will have to get replaced, which is 40,000. And then there's a pro project management fee of 28,000. We have a third party consultant who will help out with that uh, to make sure they're doing everything to the scope of work and then does a draw schedule and verifies payment uh, that's been done, everything's been done that they're asking for payment for. And the company that uh, gave the best bid and we'd like to work with is a company called Winterberry Irrigation. They're actually out of, uh, they're based out of Connecticut, but they're a national company. They actually have a five-year contract uh, for the equestrian center over in Tyron. So they're gonna be here at least for the next five years. This is actually a relatively small project for them. Uh, so they can come in here and bang it out pretty quick. And as we stated before, the source of funds, the capital reserve funds are already there uh, in, in the fund for the project. So what is the main benefit of this? Well, you know, for a golf course, uh, the superintendent, the big thing they need to do is control water both ways, whether it's an irrigation system to get water on the course or a drainage or storm water to get it off the course. Um, so we'll be doing, um, the irrigation will be going on and at the same time in-house, in we'll be doing some drainage work to improve some of the areas that are problematic as far as drainage goes. And the other advantage is that when you put out chemicals and fertilizer, uh, you're able to much better control how your water and those products in, uh, which means you won't overwater them or underwater them and it'll save you um, uh, especially environmentally, so you're not overwashing and putting things into local ponds or streams with uh, contaminants. So with the new system, we'll be able to do things that we couldn't do in the past with the technology, which is able to control the amount of water, uh, the reduction of labor expense on repairs uh, will be uh, a huge amount. We spend over $30,000 right now a year just on repairs on the current system. So right now the project we uh, think will take two to three months. There won't be any other financial impact because the way this product is installed, uh, the course can stay open during the project. Um, someone asked me where all the water comes from. Well, we have the well and the pump house is located on hole number four. That's for all the water. That's a water source for the irrigation system. And this system is a totally automated system. It has uh, rain sensors, dual head coverage. Um, it's Wi-Fi capable to allow remote on and off. It's got a weather station. So if in the middle of night, it's set to go on and you've had three inches of rain, it will set itself to go off or the, it will send a push notification and we can decide if we wanna run the system or not. And it does its own calculations on soil temp and moisture level readings in the soil to determine how much water should be put down. So uh, it's, a, it's a much needed system and it's been um, an outdated system that we're looking forward to switching over here in the upcoming year. So that pretty much finalizes the actual budget itself. So let's talk about what happens next. Um, today, obviously, uh, I presented the recommended budget to the membership. We're asking members between it could be any time, any time after this. It says the 7th, but you can start early if you want. But between now and the 14th of October, for members to send in comments or questions that can be considered, uh, send those directly to cfpoa at comporium.net. 
Um, historically, we've had quite a few people that either send directly to me, which is fine, or directly to board members, but they end up just getting forwarded to the CFPOA Emporium because we like to have them all in one location so we can make sure that we get them all, um, that we can have a response to each one. So we would encourage you again, if you're going to send in questions or comments, send it to CFPOA at Comporium.net. And then what we're going to do based on this virtual reality we're living in today is on October 19th um, at 3 p.m. we'll have another meeting like this where we will go over all the questions and comments that were uh, delivered and have responses to all of them. Now, a lot of times we get questions that are very similar question might be asked a little differently, but they're all, you know, dealing with the same topic. So we're not going to say we're going to answer each specific question uh, individually. But if your question was about golf or food and beverage, it will be tied in with all the rest. And we'll make sure that your specific question is answered, but it might be in jointly in with other questions. Um, so once that happens, um, we'll get all the input. The board will have all that input. And then they will meet the next day, October 20th at 3 p.m. and have a public special board meeting where the board will vote on the 2021 budget. Uh, assuming that the budget is passed at that meeting, the budget will be sent out to the membership on October 26th. And in that package will be a budget summary. And then it'll also include an FAQ, frequently asked questions, though a lot of it may even deal with what we dealt with on the 19th. But of all the things that we think are pertinent to the budget that came up during the process, will be included on that FAQ. And then the ballot will be due by December 4th, at which time the election committee uh, will count those budget votes and the results will be sent out as soon as possible by an e-blast and then will be formally adopted um, on Monday the 7th by the board um, based on those results. So in conclusion, uh, we're very happy to, to say that we are in a good financial position, like we've been able to say for multiple, multiple years in a row. Uh, we're, in, we're still in a position, we have no debt. We have a good discipline on our expense management, uh, very, very strong reserves. And we continue to improve our financial controls, which uh, was shown this year when we had to deal with the pandemic that we we're able to make those uh, changes on the fly and, and make sure that we ended up you know, on budget by the end of the year. And we continue to try to improve our information technology. Um, this budget is in furtherance of the strategic plan and comprehensive master plan, like we talked about, I think, on the second slide. And again, I'd encourage everyone to go to the website and read those documents. Those committees have spent a ton of time doing them. And I think anyone who looks long term and has uh, strategic goals and plans will really enjoy reading them. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect budget. Again, we learned that this year. But this budget presents what we think is the best effort of the uh, CFPOA administration, the board, and the finance committee. And we hope you will support it enthusiastically because it gives us a, a great financial footing to continue to make Conacy a great place to live and work. So we thank you for your attendance and interest today. And uh, again, any questions or comments, please send in to CFPOA at Comporium.net. And we will see you on the 19th. Thank you very much.